and welcome to the podcast, the Sports Medicine Podcast from the Huffines Institute for Sports Medicine and Human Performance. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Lightfoot, and we're so glad that you took the time to download us or you're watching us. As we say, every time we do a podcast, we work really hard to bring you someone interesting in the world of sports medicine and human performance. And certainly given what's going on uh, in the world right now with the COVID-19 virus, today is going to be not be an exception to our general rule of thumb. I would remind you before we start in with the conversation that uh, there are guidelines out there about exercising during this time, during this pandemic. As a matter of fact, you'll see a little link right down here at the bottom of the screen to the newest recommendations from the American College of Sports Medicine about exercising during the pandemic. And with that, that being said, let's just jump right in here with our guest. I am so pleased to welcome to the podcast for the first time, uh, one of my longtime acquaintances and colleagues, Dr. David Neiman. Uh, David, great to have you on. Thank you for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, you're more than welcome. Uh, I'm gonna tell the audience a little bit about you and why we're so excited to have you on and then we'll just jump right into the conversation. Um, as I said, I want to introduce Dr. David Neiman. Uh, Dr. Neiman is a professor uh, in the Health and Exercise Science Department, at, and he's the director of the Human Performance Lab at Appalachian State uh, University. He is located at the North Carolina Research Campus in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Neiman has both a Master's of Public Health and a Doctorate of Public Health from Loma Linda University. He is an incredibly eminent scientist. He has over 330 scientific publications. He has 10 books and he's garnered over $8 million in external funding. Uh, among all of his honors, and he's got many of them, he was awarded in 2013 the American College of Sports Medicine Citation Award, which is the second highest honor in exercise science. Uh, and in particular, Dr. Neiman is known for his long and um, illustrious career in exercise in immunology, looking at how exercise affects uh, immune function. And that's certainly been a topic that we've been thinking about, a lot of, been, a lot of people have been thinking about at this time. So Dr. Neiman was gracious enough to take his time today and come on and, and talk to us about that. And so I, I just, let's just start with a, a real easy question for you, and that is, does exercise affect the immune system? Yes, it does. Um, <clears throat> this is a relatively new area of scientific endeavor. It really got going in the early 1980s uh, when the HIV epidemic uh, started. And at that time, um, you know, it, it, it was definitely a scary time and many hospitals hired immunologists. Uh, they put flow cytometers into medical centers and they started uh, measuring T helper cells, et cetera. And what I did along with uh, some of my colleagues is we saw an opportunity uh, to team up mm -hmm. uh, with medical centers and uh, hospital researchers and, and to start collaborating in the area of exercise and its effects on the immune system. My first collaborator was Dr. Dr. Sandra Nielsen Canarella. She was the immunologist that was on that medical team that transplanted a baboon heart in a little baby. Wow. And, and she was one of the top immunologists uh, at that time in the early mid 80s. And uh, she uh, was passionate uh, that physiologic stress and mental stress had a negative impact on the immune system. At that time, it was just a kind of her feeling and hunch. Mm. And so um, I'll never forget the first time going to her office, we had a vibrant discussion and that began uh, our series of studies. Um, and, and first off, what we showed, um, <clears throat> see what I, had experience as a marathon runner, and I've run 58 marathons, and I was deep in the running community at that time. Is that at that time we thought, well, running a marathon is a healthy thing. Mm, but right. what I experienced in myself and uh, in my um, running buddies is that after marathon race events, we tended to get sick or have sore throats and that sort of thing. And then I started doing surveys. I found that eight out of 10 
runners claimed that during their normal training, they felt protected against sickness, but when they did marathon race events, they felt that during the week or two afterwards that they were more prone to illness. So then, uh, based on that hunch, and I think you know that in exercise science, we often take what we hear from the athletes and then see if it's true or not. Right. And so right. that. And it's those kind uh, of observations that lead to really cool stuff, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it, it, one of our. Before, but I tell you, before we get too far away from that, I, I want to just backtrack a little bit. I, I think that certainly the current generation doesn't remember how scared everyone was with HIV and yeah. how that was a different kind of, we one considered a pandemic, but no one knew what to do, whether it was safe for people to exercise around you that had HIV or not. So that really is a good contextual point for this whole thing going on right now. And, and the difference was HIV, we, we quickly uh, learned that it was 100% fatal. In, mm. in those days, it was fatal and often very quick. And it, it was scary. And I remember, um, you know, when infected kids would go to school, the parents would get very upset. What if my child gets bit during recess by someone who's infected? What will happen? They were afraid mosquitoes would uh, draw blood from an infected person and take it uh, to you. So it, it was a scary time, but science led us out of it. And uh, it, it opened up the door for our field of exercise immunology. That really was the start of the whole thing. So well, one of our first studies based on these surveys and experience and case histories is we went to the Los Angeles Marathon uh, administrators and, and we said, could, could we uh, do an epidemiologic study of your uh, applicants there? And we got 2,300 runners at the 1987 LA Marathon to uh, allow us to retrospectively look at their training for the two month period coming into the race and then follow them for a week after the race. Boy, and no, one cannot, no one can argue with that sample size, can they? No, it's still the largest study ever done. And what we showed is that during the week uh, after that race, the odds of getting sick were 5.9 times higher than in a group of marathon runners that had actually applied to run the race, but then ran it, did not run it for reasons other than sickness. We also showed that in a two month period, and the, the races run in March every year, we showed that in the two month period before the race, uh, runners who were training more than 60 miles a week had double the odds of getting sick compared to runners running less. And so that this was the first really good evidence that there was something to a uh, marathon race event. But as we were doing that, um, then we kept getting asked the question, well, so many of us feel that we're protected during training, what about that? So then we did some randomized training studies, took sedentary people, and randomized them to five days a week, 45 minutes of walking versus a control group who did, did nothing. They just continued their sedentary lives. And we showed in um, a series of three randomized trials that uh, those who were randomized to the walking group for 12 to 15 weeks uh, experienced a 45% reduction in uh, the number of illness days during a 12-week, 15-week period. And then we did a, another epidemiologic study of 1,000 individuals and indeed showed that those who uh, self-selected themselves into a high activity group uh, compared to not basically no exercise at all, that there was a 43% difference in the number of illness days. So our data and the data from other uh, investigators has consistently shown that people who engage in near daily activity um, have a, about a 40-50% reduction in illness days. So then of course the next question was, was how can that all happen? And so we did a series of studies in the laboratory where we would walk people for 45 minutes 
versus having people sit in the lab mm. and then they would reverse roles a week later and then we followed their immune response for up to 24 hours and basically what we showed there is that during a 45 minute walk uh, very important immune cells are recruited into circulation right now as we sit here most of our immune cells are in the spleen and the thymus and the lymph nodes and in peripheral areas exercise actually brings some of these cells out and what's very interesting is the cells that are recruited are the most important cells of all mm. the neutrophils and the natural killer cells cytotoxic t cells these are upfront highly active cell uh, immune cells that can detect pathogens and quickly uh, deal with them and destroy them or the cells that uh, the viruses are in. And, and then we showed that that effect though uh, was transient and it was gone in about three hours. And so- uh, So you had that uh, effect for about three hours and then it kind of went away? Yep, uh, went away. In fact, we showed in training studies, we had hoped that there was some chronic alteration in immune function that could be measured and we can never find anything. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we really believe is happening is that the decrease in illness is a summation effect of the regular acute changes that take place every time you exercise. So it builds up over time. I right. tell people it's like having a, uh, a house cleaner come into your house 30, 45 minutes every day and if you're, uh, you know, most, most of us have kids and we know how messy the house can get. Just imagine having a housekeeper come in 30, 45 minutes a day. At the end of the month, it's going to look a lot better than if that housekeeper didn't come in. And we think that's how it, it, it works. It's pretty much a summation effect of the regular acute changes that take place. And then people said, well, then why is a marathon race so bad? Right, and, and then right. we did question, a whole bunch yeah. of studies there. And basically... We show that as you do high intensity, unrelenting exercise, like running a half marathon or, or longer, that as your glycogen stores are depleted, um, then stress hormones go up, inflammatory signals go up, oxidative stress goes up, and the immune system reflects that physiologic stress, and there's a transient downturn. Um, and this, the transient downturn is a matter of hours up to a day, usually after a marathon race. But lately, we've been looking into overtraining, where athletes uh, engage in a lot of exercise for weeks and weeks. And we showed there that the dysfunction uh, can last for weeks uh, after those kinds of overtraining periods. We just published a study. Uh, on, on the athlete that trekked across Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So there's a new technology. You can take finger prick uh, drop blood, uh, uh, just one drop of blood. You can train the athlete to do it. It goes onto a, a Wattman card, it dries. And then from that dried blood spot sample, uh, we punch out the middle of it. And we can now, using LCMS MS technology, measure over 800 proteins. Uh, from that single drop of blood. Many of them are from the immune system. And we have shown now shifts in about 70 different immune-related proteins that occur during uh, like uh, non-functional overreaching or overtraining that indicate the immune system is in a chronic state of dysfunction for weeks. So, so that, that, that's really uh, say decades of research quickly there, but that's what we think is happening. Well, I, I was just going to say that, that then that really starts to highlight the fact that uh, some exercise is good, but too much is not good. Yep. As I tell my students, water's good for you, but you can drown in it as well. <laughs> yeah, we just have to find a happy sweet spot. Everybody's different too. There, there are some people that can put in quite a bit and do just fine. Uh, some people if they dare uh, to put in more than an hour a day, they can start to break down, mainly in the immune area. Now, 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 David, does this have something to do with the intensity of the exercise? I know some of the guidance out there says, uh, and I think you were kind of hinting at this, you know, moderate activity is okay, but if you get into the vigorous activity, 
Um, they, they don't usually give timelines on that, but they say vigorous activity can actually decrease immune functioning. Would you go with that kind of statement? Well, we uh, have found, uh, we, we have had uh, rowers, tennis athletes, um, and, and other uh, similar types of athletes who will engage in intermittent activity where it's a back and forth nature, mm -hmm. sports play or drills and that sort of thing. The immune system responds to that very well. I mean, you can go for hours with intermittent activity and, and we, it looks like the immune system that you've been on a brisk walk or something, there's no mm -hmm. problem. It's when the intensity is high and you're pushing it there's no intermittent nature to it, like you're running a marathon race, and then those glycogen stores go way down. And we have found that the glycogen depletion appears to be a real key stimulator of the red flag mode that the immune system can go into after that. So, so let me ask, there's, there's a lot of interest nowadays and in a lot of people doing the high intensity interval training types of things. During a, a situation like we have right now with the pandemic, would you encourage people to continue that or, or discontinue that for a few weeks? Or what kind of specific recommendations would you give them for that? Well, based on everything we know, both with humans, but also in animal studies, I'm telling people um, that, for example, if you do something like a marathon race, hmm. you are actually immunocompromised uh, for hours afterwards, mm. uh, even for a day. Mm. You have put yourself into that class of uh, individual who we are most worried about right now. And so I think that at this time, people should avoid any high intensity sustained effort, uh, half marathon or greater. I'm glad that the marathon races and half marathon races are being canceled. Uh, it's not just the, that because people travel to those events and then there's a lot of social uh, interaction, but it's also because I feel that those people after those races are especially prone uh, to acquiring the COVID-19. Now, of course, we don't have data, but we do have data from other viral illnesses. I have a 1950 JAMA article uh, where they observed uh, when, when there was a polio epidemic, that uh, the individuals who were most prone to the uh, most severe paralytic form of polio were those who had, had engaged in heavy exertion just prior to coming down with the paralytic form of polio. Uh, after that, uh, primates were taken and uh, infected with viruses, uh, different systemic viruses and exercised heavily. And those primates uh, became more ill and mortality rates went up. Uh, this has been done in rabbits and roosters and horses, all sorts of animals showing that if you have an, an infected animal and exercise them heavily, they can either die from that or are more prone to a severe, longer, uh, duration of that illness. So I think based on everything we have that people need to be careful right now. I tell people think about your health and not your fitness right now. Yeah, now is not the time to worry about your personal records, your PRs. Now is the time to worry about your health. Yeah. Uh, continuing to exercise, just not at that strenuous, uh, long duration yeah. type of, of yeah. activity. Yeah, and that's the good news is there are very few people that are doing marathon type efforts right now. Um, the good news is that uh, we know that when people put in 30, 60 minutes on most days of the week, that that will enhance the circulation of important immune cells that can better detect and destroy viruses. Now we don't know if that's true with the COVID-19. My feeling based on all the animal and human work that has been done, that that will end up being shown, that we will see that uh, the ability to actually take care of that virus and perhaps a more, have a more mild form of the illness will be related uh, to regular physical activity. So we have enough data for me to, uh, with confidence, say that I highly recommend that people try to put in activity 
on most days of the week during this, uh, this pandemic. Now, of course, I'm, you know, there's certain acceleration zones right now, like New York City, mm -hmm. where I think they've actually told people they can't even go outside uh, and exercise. And, um, you know, they'll, everybody has to obey those rules. But I think right now, if you're in an acceleration zone and they say you can't even go out by yourself and exercise, then while you're indoors, you know, do a calisthenic routine or if you have a treadmill or a bicycle, uh, it'd be one of the most important things you could do while you're waiting everything out. You know, you raised a point that I'd really like to come back and clarify uh, a bit. You know, as you said, we really don't know if everything applies to COVID-19, but we've got some good guesses or some good rationale for why it does apply. I mean, some of your earlier work did deal, deal with virus infections, right, in, in some of the subjects that you tested earlier. Exactly. So the rhinovirus causes about half of the common cold episodes. But the coronavirus, so the coronavirus, there's seven types. Hmm. And there's three or four that are kind of more the mild, moderate types that cause common colds in people. So, of course, in our studies, we never knew which virus was causing the illness. Hmm. But we show whether it was in the winter or the spring um, or the fall we were able to show in all of those seasons that people exercising uh, were less prone to illness. The rhinovirus is more prevalent in the fall and the coronavirus is more prevalent in the spring. So uh, we think at least there's enough data to at least infer that most acute respiratory tract infectious agents, um, that if you are active, with, that you will, will have better surveillance against them and, and can better remove them from your body. I, I tell people the immune system actually needs exercise to do its job at the proper level. Yeah, it keeps it ramped up and primed to do its job. Yep, well, it's kind of, I tell people it's like, they say that uh, there's some army rangers, some special op fighters in a base uh, and then you get them out circulating around to engage the enemy uh, and then they go back to the base. And that's what happens every time you exercise, you, you get the special ops out doing their thing and then they go back. And, and that is about as good as, as an analogy as you can get. Um, you have to get the immune cells out and moving around and that's what exercise does. Well, if there's, and, and I don't know if it's like it there as it is here, but I have noticed since uh, we've been told to shelter in place, it is amazing how many people are actually out exercising, who are out walking, walking their dogs, walking with their significant other. And so if maybe one of the silver linings is that more people are being active when they've been told to stay in place. I mean, that's the exception. We can't go outside and exercise, even though we've been told to shelter in place but perhaps maybe that's one of the silver lines of this is that people are gonna think about this and actually get outside and do some more activity. Yes, and, and I think that is gonna be one of the ways that in the end, uh, we get this virus under control. I think that ultimately though, until we get a vaccine, um, uh, that we will not conquer this virus. I think you saw that Tony uh, Fauci is basically saying he, this may end up being a seasonal coronavirus, mm -hmm. just like the other ones are, and that in the end, it's going to take a vaccine to, to tame it. Yeah, it looks like we've got a little bit of a road ahead of us, that is for sure. Yeah. So as all of our normal listeners know, at this, this time as we wrap up the podcast, uh, we give our, our guests an opportunity to t give the audience a take-home message. So if there was one thing that you want people to remember, if they didn't remember anything else about what we've talked about today, what would you tell them? You know, Ken Cooper one time said, walk your dog every day, whether you have one or not. <laughs> and I like that. And that would be pretty much what I'd recommend to everybody. Get out, go on a good 45 minute brisk walk just about every day and I think you're gonna be able to cope better, um, both physically, mentally, and hopefully uh, with your immune system as well. Fabulous. Great take home message. And David, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule to be with us. 
And I want to thank all of you that are listening and watching. Thank you for being with us and downloading us. We do hope that you're staying healthy uh, and taking all the precautions, uh, social distancing, coughing into your elbows, and washing your hands all the time. And again, as we said at the top of the show, if you need the guidelines for how to exercise during the COVID-19 pandemic, whether inside or outside, if you'll check out the little link that comes up right here on our screen, that takes you to the newest recommendations that have just been updated a couple of days ago from the American College of Sports Medicine. So until next week and next time we have another interesting person on our podcast, we do hope that you take care of yourself, stay active and stay healthy. 